Hello, everybody. Um, thank you. Welcome to another session. Um, this time, we're, we're very fortunate to, um, to hopefully get some more detail on something that's been widely reported in the, in the press and that as a, um, as a GP I'm particularly interested in, um, which, is, which is devolution in Manchester. Um, I, I was just reflecting there backstage on how, um, as a GP, since, since CCGs came into being, how so much of my role now is working with local authority colleagues, um, how my perception of my job has changed in terms of um, the introduction of social prescribing um, and the realisation, really, that, that various um, academics say that between 40 to 70% of the health outcomes that my patients... Um, that, that affect my patients are related to socio-economic factors, whereas only 10 to 15% relate to the health care that I commission. So how do we do that, and what structures do we have in place? Well, in Manchester, devolution is the flavour, and I think hopefully we'll hear from three speakers today um, and find out more on what's beneath the surface, really, of, um, of Devil Mank, as it's been called. So we have three speakers. Um, we have Sir Richard Lease at the far side, who's... Um, leader of Manchester City Council. We have Philip Blond, director of Res Publica. And we have Ian Williamson, who's the interim chief officer of Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Devolution. So I'm not going to talk for long because you've not come to listen to me, you've come to listen to them. We'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so we'll pass over first to Richard. If I can just say at the end, we've got, I don't think the previous section had the iPad. You can log on to the website or go to the website and submit questions. I have an iPad, I'll do my best to refer to it at the end if there are questions that, um, that are appropriate, so thank you. Thanks very much, good evening uh, everybody. It's probably appropriate that we are in the Echo Arena because I think there are still shot waves reverberating from when the 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester, the 12 clinical commissioning groups, and NHS England uh, announced what was actually the next stage of health and social care integration for Greater Manchester earlier this year. Next stage following on from the devolution agreement signed between Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the government in November the 3rd last year. Uh, Clearly, I'm not a health uh, professional. I'm going to leave a lot of the health and social care side of this uh, to Ian, who's going to uh, follow me. But I really want to try and address the questions. Where did all this come from? Why? And why Great, uh, Greater Manchester? Uh, the third of those questions is relatively easy. Uh, why Greater Manchester? Well, largely because it's our idea. Uh, but uh, it was... Uh, uh, an idea that took a long time to realise. What uh, appeared to a lot of people to ha happen very, very quickly, uh, I would go back to 1986. 1986, the abolition of the Greater Manchester County Council, when the ten local authorities uh, made the decision that they would continue to work together on a whole range of uh, issues. I could go back to 1999, when uh, the English core cities um, started to make the economic case for devolution based on uh, the very excitingly titled functional economic uh, area and the conurbations, the metropolitan areas, the city or uh, the name coined not so long ago, county, uh, county uh, regions and spent probably a decade building up an evidence base around that and it's important to recognise that all of this started with economic uh, de de devolution and ended up at health and social care uh, a bit down, bit down the track and very, very powerful evidence base that shows that in those countries where nations invest more in their second tier cities and devolve more powers to those second tier cities, not only do those cities perform better economically, then the nations perform better economically uh, as well. Uh, Greater Manchester had its first Greater Manchester Economic Strategy in 2001, 
And in 2006, we approached the government, uh, then in the form of David Miliband, and said that we believed that in order to uh, meet our objectives, our relationship needed to be put onto a statutory basis. A voluntary association was simply not good enough. And we did that on a three-party basis. So it's a partnership that crossed boundaries, but also crossed political parties as well. And it took us five years to get from there to the establishment of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority in 2011. It was unique for three years, but there are now four other combined authorities uh, powering the same, uh, the same furrow. The development of our approach to health and social care integration and devolution uh, followed on from that, and it came from the merger of a number of, uh, of work strands, and a number of work strands that operated at, uh, uh, at different levels, and in some cases were happening simultaneously in different geographies without necessarily being uh, particularly connected. Um, if I look at just Manchester, the city alone, uh, when we were still at the stage of having a shadow health and wellbeing board, uh, we commissioned work from uh, McKinsey to look at health, particularly looking at over... Uh, over 65s and that work uh, uh, showed that we had f far too many over 65s going into uh, hospitals when they went they were staying there too long and indeed far too many of them never came out or at least never came out uh, came out alive and that there was an enormous financial cost to, to that but there was an enormous social cost as well that we were uh, people were having significantly worse quality of life as a result of uh, of that and that led us clearly to uh, the view that we needed to be providing far more effective uh, care, both social and health, in community settings, that we needed to be doing more to prevent unnecessary admissions into hospital, and we needed to be do doing more to make sure that when people who did need to go to hospital because they needed treatments were able to be discharged uh, quickly into a, a proper uh, care structure uh, for, for them. We're able to expand that analysis to the, uh, the whole population and uh, there are indications that in the city of Manchester alone, that as well as providing better quality of life, we could be saving up to £20 million uh, a, a year by doing things in a more efficient way. In a similar time frame, uh, NHS England uh, were about to launch a consultation uh, with, uh, called Healthier uh, Together. And as they were talking about that consultation, uh, by and large, the, the local authorities and the CCGs uh, ganged up on uh, NHS England and say, if you launch a consultation in this way, you're going to have everybody uh, opposing it. Uh, it was a fairly typical NHS uh, uh, consultation. I'm not too worried if, if I upset too many people uh, here. Um, Ian will talk about it being clinically led. Most of you will probably think clinically led is wonderful. Uh, those of us that aren't in the health sector tend to think clinical le led means it's acting in the interest of the clinicians rather than in the interest of the uh, of patients. And we wanted something that uh, didn't have acute services, and actually a relatively small number of specialised acute services leading how we constructed our health system. We wanted something that would start at a local level, at a, a basic level, and work up. So what we needed to do with the acute sector came at the end of the chain rather than the beginning of, uh, of the chain. And I think together we convinced NHS England of that. And we then set about a very different uh, consultation, which will still end up with major changes to how acute care is provided, but based on all of the 10 local authorities having their own integrated health and social care strategy, in Manchester's case, uh, living longer, living better, but that's replicated in all the other nine areas within, uh, within Greater Manchester. Um, I spoke to other, three other things that go with this. First of all, um, the, the right timing. We had NHS England Simon Stevens five year forward review and a forward review that basically said that if we're going to solve the problems we face within the sectors uh, then we can't do the same everywhere and that we do need to have uh, some experimentation. We need to try uh, different things. The establishment of CCGs and health and wellbeing boards itself is sign uh, significant because I think for the first time in a lot of localities that a relationship was established 
between GPs and local authorities that never existed before. And whilst it might not have been anticipated, once that relationship started to be uh, established, then CCGs and local authorities through health and wellbeing boards started look, to look at things in a different way. Um, the last thing that uh, contributed to this agenda, and it's the thing that glued it all together, was the public service reform uh, agenda. Started with total place under the last Labour government, which uh, in Manchester, Greater Manchester, led us to look at the totality of public sector expenditure across the conurbation. At that time, round about 22 billion, uh, notwithstanding five years of cuts. Uh, expenditure in the conurbation, public sector expenditure, is still round about 22 billion. However, uh, much of that spend has gone from investment into people into treating creator dependency over that, uh, uh, over that period of time. Um, in the early stages of the last government, we were, uh, Greater Manchester was a whole place community budget pilot uh, area. And we're, through that work, we're able to demonstrate that if we're going to tackle complex dependency, including uh, health issues, that one size fits all, <coughs> siloed national programs, that, that approach is broken. It doesn't work. A uh, classic example is the work program, where for people on ESA or in incapacity benefit, the success rate is virtually zero. Uh, it simply doesn't uh, work. But we're able to demonstrate that if instead of <coughs> those silent programs, we build programs around people, their families and the places uh, they live that we can have a phenomenal impact <coughs> on some of the neediest people within, uh, within society. Um, if we looked at the factors in complex dependency and say, if I take uh, child poverty in Manchester, something like, of the families in poverty, something like 95% of them don't have a working adult within the family. If I look at troubled families, something like 70% of our troubled family cohorts don't have a working adult in the, uh, in the families. And what that identified for us was, uh, for the first time, a, a very strong link between social policy and economic policy, and that strong link was fundamentally about worklessness, getting people into, uh, in, into work. We now have a, a programme working well, commissioned in Greater Manchester. It's about getting 50,000 people currently on incapacity benefit back, uh, back into work. Uh, it's not going to be easy. 92% of those people have never worked. 87% uh, of them have no skills. Virtually all of them have either a physical or a mental health issue, or in many cases, uh, many cases both. Uh, it means that if we're going to get those people back into work, health has to be part of the uh, part of the solution to that. So now, when we look at health and social care integration and, and devolution. It's not simply about integrating health and social care, it's about integrating health and social care as part of the array of public services that we have within the city region, and particularly those that address the neediest people within uh, the city region. And that leads to uh, sort of re uh, interesting results that with health and social care as part of that broader public service reform agenda, amongst other things, work now becomes a health outcome. Health and social care alone cannot tackle health inequalities, and there's no more uh, pronounced uh, place for health inequalities than the uh, city of Manchester. Uh, if we're going to tackle health inequalities, we also have to tackle the social determinants of poor health, and again, health has to be part of that integrated solution. So what does devolution allow us to do? Well, uh, devolution allows us to commission at different spatial levels, starting with the city region level, but to deliver services in an integrated way, a new joined up way, at the family and neighbourhood level. I think the approach we're taking, it's got risks attached to it, but it is evidence-based and we've built that evidence up by, uh, through a number of routes over a number of years, and ultimately it needs to lead to a healthier population, a less dependent population, and a population that has less demand on very expensive and short supply uh, public services. That will ultimately allow us to close a fiscal gap in Greater Manchester, the fact that uh, public services cost more than we currently raise uh, in, in ta taxation. 
and at least part, uh, partly allows us to address the poison chalice that health expenditure is failing to keep up with demand and social care expenditure is going down very, very rapidly as demand increases. The poison chalice is there and I uh, often said, well, given that, why do you want to take greater control over health and social care? And it's a very easy answer to that is that we think we'd be a damn sight better at doing that than civil servants away in, uh, away in Whitehall. The, the ultimate question is why devolution? Well, the current system isn't working. It isn't working for people, and the fact that it isn't working is the real imperative for change. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. I have been an accountable chief executive in the NHS for nine years and now find myself with a true once in a career opportunity. Like so many of you here today, I entered public service to make a real positive difference. I feel excited and apprehensive in equal measure about the opportunity and the challenge of devolution in Greater Manchester. Greater Manchester was the birthplace of the NHS, not to mention Emmeline Pankhurst, the cooperative movement, some fantastic music, the Guardian newspaper, modern computer science, the splitting of the atom, graphene and some football clubs, most notably Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> First, some context. Greater Manchester devolution is a huge step for government and for NHS England. Some would say it's a risky one because if we don't succeed, it will make it much harder for others to follow. My job, along with the 37 leaders of the statutory bodies uh, listed on the map behind you, is to make sure we succeed. And by the way, we now have the support and active involvement of primary care as providers, GPs as providers, through the association of LMCs, so we have more than 37 organisations. Our aim through devolution of health and social care is to ensure the greatest and the fastest possible improvement to the health and well-being of the 2.7 million people of Greater Manchester. We have a growing collaboration between councils and the NHS. It's fairly recently that we've worked cohesively together, and Richard has mentioned the Healthier Together programme. This enabled us to agree a common approach to primary care, a common approach to joined up, integrated and health and social care in the community, and a combined approach to improving hospital standards for emergency care and emergency surgery. I have learned, often through challenge, that we can achieve things together that we could never achieve separately. The NHS working together has also made significant strides in our area, resulting, for example, in a major trauma network, stroke service centralisation and the transformation of women's and children's services. So we have a track record. And it is this track record that made it possible for the February signing of our Memorandum of Understanding, i.e. councils with a joint strategy and strong leadership. Clinical commissioners demonstrating collective determination to improve standards and outcomes. Providers welcoming a new paradigm in a tough world. And NHS England, the Department of Health and the Treasury showing the will to back us and to work in partnership. Devolution now challenges us on a massive collective scale. And our challenge is a huge one. Ah. Ah. No. Yes. No. Um, this slide shows, it may be the same as the last one, um, this slide shows that despite a growing economy, we have over 100,000 people unemployed, life expectancy and child poverty worse than the England average, and over 100,000 people on long-term sickness benefit and inactive. So we intend to use this unique opportunity to drive growth and jobs, thereby impacting on health inequalities. I know that many of you are wrestling with similar issues to those behind me. Ultimate success for us is in shifting these dials in a way that we haven't been able to do before now. And to do so at a time when the money has never felt so tight. 
So what's our approach? My central hypothesis is that some of those numbers could be better than they are now if it wasn't for the sector and statutory boundaries that exist between us. Our approaches and behaviours have often been conditioned by those boundaries rather than our common purpose of improving the health and well-being of the population we serve. It's not because we are bad people. Well, most of us aren't anyway. Um, it's because success has been defined by the statutory bodies that we are part of. Now, Greater Manchester devolution is not about ripping up the statutory status of local authorities, CCGs and NHS Foundation Trusts, at least for now. It, but it is about integrating our planning and delivery so that we drive up outcomes and drive out inefficiencies. It's about putting people and place before institutions and organisations. It's about putting the residents of our 10 boroughs before our individual NHS boardrooms and council chambers. In this way, I have already learnt in the two months I've been in the role that this adventure is not just about devolution from London and national bodies. It's as much about our capability to build strong, effective relationships and leadership within Greater Manchester. Yes, we do need control of the £6 billion plus of resources spent on health and social care, and we will. But that control is only worthwhile if we then deliver better outcomes and experiences. As a result, I believe we can make progress like we've never made before across the whole city region, and within that, our statutory bodies can deliver their duties in a more resilient way going forward. There will be significant changes in the way we work and ultimately in the way we organise ourselves. If we carry on as we are now, we are not sustainable clinically or financially. So we must identify and agree better and different solutions. And we will do this through our approach to devolution in Greater Manchester. So what are we doing and what is planned? And I'll just go back to the previous slide if I missed that one for your interest. Let me, we've had standing room only at our recent leadership assemblies for the leaders of our 37 organisations and other partners. This has captured the imagination of the scores of people who lead our health and wealth and wellbeing services in our city region. Let me share with you some of our current work. First of all, how will we integrate? I'll give you three short examples. Firstly, integrated governance. Binding on all the partners, decisive and bold at local borough and CCG level, and also at Greater Manchester level for decisions that impact on the full 2.7 million population. We will have this up and running soon, so we operate in shadow form from October this year. The Devolution Programme Board, co-chaired by Simon Stevens and Sir Howard Bernstein, has already met three times since March. Secondly, integrated planning. As we speak, the organisations in Greater Manchester are creating 10 local plans, one for each borough, which will come together with big Greater Manchester-wide transformation proposals to provide our platform for 2016 onwards. So joint local plans and an overall GM plan by December. We're also linking into the comprehensive spending review process to ensure we give ourselves our best shot of achieving our aims. Thirdly, integrated delivery. We have examples, like many of you will have, of social care and health care services and teams working together. Our intention is to do that at pace and at scale, sensitive to the needs of our local communities and significant enough to have a real impact. So integrated governance, integrated planning, integrated delivery. Our early priorities in this build-up year range from improving primary care access, to a joined up academic health science system. From a place-based agreement with Public Health England to mental health and work programmes. From constructive early dialogue with Monitor and the TDA to taking on specialist commissioning now. We have a vision for our 2.7 million population and devolution gives us the opportunity to design a social movement to engage our residents in this like never before. We need to engage with our population and ensure that that oneless uh, agenda of 10 years ago becomes more of a reality. 
but devolution is a means to an end, it's not an end in itself. And we are challenging ourselves to regard nothing as being off limits. Devolution enables us to work not just across physical and mental health, and across primary care and hospital care, and across social care and health care, but also across housing, employment, and education. All those areas that we know are hugely linked when it comes down to people's day-to-day -day lives. But, so we are linking, so we are integrating not just health and social care, but also linking into the growth agenda. And it frees us up to be able to do far more of what our residents want without being quite so affected by national views and concerns, whilst remaining part of the NHS, its constitution and its mandate. Our plan then is for full, fully operating devolution from April 2016. To conclude, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for our people and our place, and we won't let it go. My family were born in Greater Manchester, go to school locally, and I have received brilliant health care two miles from where I live. So this is personal for me and for so many others. This is for Greater Manchester by the people of Greater Manchester. The commitment of colleagues locally and nationally to make this work is palpable and very powerful. I look forward to returning next year, if invited, to update you on our progress. Thank you very much. You're all probably quite close to being devoed out, so um, I'm going to continue. Uh, um, why, why am I here? Um, a couple of reasons, I think. We at Res Publica wrote the original uh, report, Devo Max, Devo Mank. Uh, I was one of uh, the co-authors, and. I want to talk about where the inspiration for that came from, because I think this is, that's why devolution isn't, is such a pressing need for our country at this point. Let's take several steps back. Let's ask why the state isn't working. And who isn't the state working for? Predominantly, the state isn't working for those people who desperately need the state to work for it. Those with long-term conditions, unemployed, ill health, generally at the bottom end of the socio-economic ladder. I grew up and was raised in Liverpool. Go to the north part of the city and you'll see levels of deprivation that quite simply have been uh, for generations. And every recession that we've suffered, we've never been able to recover from, at least in this city. So it always interested me is why the state, that if you do place-based analysis, spent billions and got so little back for it. And that's largely because I think the 1945 state, which in many ways was right for the time, is, is misdesigned for the problems we face now and is certainly completely inappropriate for the future. What have we got? We've got a state that delivers siloed or segregated public services into the same place, each with its own infrastructure and management, and often those silos conflict. They fight one another. So we're paying from the same public money uh, across multiple silos, multiple layers of management, and if you McKinsey confirm that you lose 30% of every frontline budget with every layer of management you go through. In our Devo Mank uh, report that we did with um, Greater Manchester and, and Sir Richard's officers, we started trying to calculate how many performance indices there were for each level of expenditure or ring-fenced funding uh, that was sent into Manchester. And we got to about 1,200 and we stopped counting. Now, of course, it won't be news to you that each one of those individual performance indicators was often in complete contradiction to another performance indicator in the same area and in the same region. So you, in effect, had siloed services, 
at enormous cost, replicating that cost and bureaucracy, and judged by different performance indicators that weren't coherent and conflicted. Well, no wonder the state doesn't work. And what we've produced in this country now, under the guise of universalization, which was the idea that we have to give the same thing to everybody, otherwise we wouldn't have equality, is in the name of equality something that has produced the most rampant levels of inequality. Why? Because we've enforced the same model everywhere, regardless of the conditions anywhere. And we've produced, if you like, a suit that we've designed for everyone that doesn't fit a single person. And that's fine if you're middle class, if you're well paid, if you're adroit, you can do well nonetheless. But if you're not, the cost for it keeps being paid and it keeps getting higher and higher. And we know from all the social um, uh, judgments and evidence on mobility is the cost of losing in our world is getting higher and it's getting harder and harder to get back. And if you fall back, it's tougher and tougher to recover. So what we have is a fragmented state where different parts of the state uh, essentially have frozen, have, have given up and can't seem and are not capable of addressing the problems. So the clear thing we have to do is to reunify the state, is to create a state that's holistic, that wraps around uh, people and gives them what they so desperately need which is whole person care, often delivered at a single point of use that factors in all the problems that they face. And so Richard and Ian, who've both commented rightly in my view, that probably the best health indicator you can have for a human being is do they work? That probably outcompetes everything else. And the failure of our state is, I think, most marked by that other great indicator, postcode of birth, which to my knowledge, is still the most successful indicator of what will happen to you in your life, the postcode where you're born. Now, to my view, the central state cannot and is incapable of tackling these levels of entrenched problems. It simply is not designed for it. And if we leave it as it is, the condition of those who are losing will just get worse and get worse exponentially. The only hope is to redesign the state but not from the top down, we've done that for years and it's never worked and it just creates more conflict, more bureaucracy, more overhead. But to reunify it from the bottom up, to take a service that's fragmented where different parts of it can declare UDI and then there's nothing much anyone can do and create uh, a devolved area with clear forms of accountability that can actually stitch it all back together again. Now, many of you are doctors, and it must be very difficult, I think, being a doctor, because you know you're always dealing with effects and not causes. You can't give a person a job. You can't make their area beautiful so that they feel safe to walk so they can tackle obesity. You probably know in your heart of hearts that actually what we have is an acute service that now can't manage the chronic conditions. And those chronic conditions that are a result of all the social factors that, all of, uh, that everybody's already mentioned, diabetes, cancer, dementia, obesity, we can't fund them. We don't have a way of getting money out of the acute sector into community health care at sufficient scale to tackle those problems. 70% of all NHS bed days are consumed by people with long-term conditions. 70% of all NHS funding is consumed by people with long-term conditions, some 15 million people in England. Unless we create the ability to shift resources from dealing with effects and to causes, we are not going to solve the problems that confront this country. Devolution, in my view, is necessary but not sufficient because we need many things. But it's the only systemic game in town that can possibly, possibly shift things back to, the where, to, the, to where it's needed. Which is to create an integrated system that intervenes upstream. Where we know, for instance, schools are often first responders. They know when children are in trouble and we know we can identify the trouble that children are in very, very early. 
But at the moment, many of them don't know what to do, don't know who, who to refer it to. <coughs> How can we change our walking areas and the design of our cities outside of councils? At Res Publica, we have a Right to Beauty project where we want to give people the ability to change their locality so it becomes, in part, pleasant to walk, safe. That's why, again, I support the Manchester deal by giving crime to the, to the mayor to create low-crime areas so people feel they can walk. Again, part of, kind of, of what I would like to see is the ability for GPs to refer people to home insulation when, for instance, they have patients who are suffering often in privately rented sector in un terrible conditions. These are the sort of simple, obvious moves that are currently beyond us. And unless we solve these problems, there's no solving the problems that confront us. Now, Manchester has a great noble history of working together. And let's be honest, in many of our parts of our country, we don't have that political situation. In Liverpool, everyone's from the same party, but boy, do they enjoy falling out with each other and fighting with one another. Now, that's fine and fun, but it results in terrible public services. It results in levels of deprivation that are amongst the highest in Europe. Other areas are similarly moribund because of political inability and inertia. And one of the things I think that devolution offers us the ability to do is actually challenge the fragmented system. At the moment, we have a system where, effectively, in health, each part of the system can declare UDI. I was chatting with Ian before. You know, there are hospitals that can go to monitor, strike a deal, and, and say quite happily, well, I'm not working with you because this is how we view we should pursue things. This is something, in my view, that should no longer be acceptable. What I think we need to do is create the conditions for genuine integration, not just in Manchester, but everywhere else. We need, for instance, lead CCGs who can actually become the lead CCGs in their area and gather in all their expertise. We need to par parallel that with health and well-being boards that similarly can leverage in their expertise. And just as Manchester are working towards creating a new governance model, so we need a new governance model for commissioning. Now, the most interesting thing in the Manchester model is the forum that they've created for alternate providers. It's imperative, in my view, given the way acute care captures all the money and prevents us funding properly community care, that we actually look at commissioning a whole new range of holistic providers or integrated care providers who can deliver the type of wraparound care that alone can engender the type of transformations that we need. And this is, I think, where the innovations in Manchester will lie, and we look forward to exploring that. For other areas, what I think you should ask is how can we do something similar? What are the standards of evidence that we need to meet in order to create these outcomes? If Manchester's got this permission, you should welcome it, but you should also ask what, by what criteria and how can we meet that criteria? And how can we create, wherever we are, the conditions for similarly creating the evidential base and the procedural base and the administrative base. That should be your agenda for the future because without that there is no solving the health or indeed the social crisis in this country. Devolution sounds a, a little messianic, I know, but I cannot see anything that we all want happening outside of an agenda of devolution. Devolution is necessary but how we achieve it in different areas, in rural areas, in mixed areas, I think that is the accountability issue, the governance issue. We can work with something that will deliver. And I look forward to working on that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, we'll take some questions in a, in a moment. I've got a question particularly for, um, for Richard Nee. As, as co-chair of NHS Commissioners, we've done a lot of work around the future of health and wellbeing boards. And I notice that the Manchester, Greater Manchester MOU doesn't actually refer to health and wellbeing boards at all. So I wonder what the future is of, of health and wellbeing boards in your area. Well, uh, 
It's, it's a good question. First of all, it's, it's worth uh, reminding people who the Memorandum of Understanding is between. It's between the 12 clinical commissioning groups, the 10 local authorities, and NHS uh, England. Uh, and secondly, there is no provision for a health and wellbeing board at that spatial uh, uh, level. So, uh, and it may be that on the devolution legislation that we can have a statutory health and wellbeing board that will operate at a Greater Manchester level. But thirdly, this is a devolutionary uh, agreement, not a centralising agreement. And the 10 health and wellbeing boards will continue to do their statutory job at a local authority level, just that even, uh, in some individual CCGs will be continuing to de uh, develop commissioning of GPs at that level rather than a, a, a GM level. Uh, the fact it's devolutionary, not centralising, is very, very important. Yeah, I'll, I'll, anything to add on that? Or no? Okay. We've got a question over here, number one. Hi, uh, Dean Smith here from Four Seasons Healthcare. Uh, I think uh, this is a very important step. This is probably one of the most important steps in uh, the history of the NHS since '48. as Philip says, perhaps uh, you know, much more broadly than just healthcare. My question to each of you, though, is what is the single biggest thing that might make this fail. Okay, we'll take one more question while you're thinking about that from number two up there. Oh, number three, okay. Hello, I'm Mark Rowland. I'm chair of Lewisham CCG and chair of the London CCGs. Um, obviously, we're very interested in what Manchester is doing, and I believe very passionately in all that you said there. But what I'd like you to do is possibly clarify what's devolution in this, what's collaboration, what's integration, and what's prevention because I've not heard quite that clarity in what I would need to do to make it work for London or section of London. Thank you. Okay. So what can make it fail and what's devolved? Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll kick off on, on, uh, on that if you wish. Uh, just on, on Mark's question first, if the, uh, what's, what's devolved? Well, uh, in technical terms, What's devolved, in addition to uh, what CCGs have already, is primary care and specialised commissioning. So uh, we currently already control four and a half out of the six billion of uh, health and social care spend in Greater Manchester, uh, health and social care. Uh, what we don't have uh, direct control of is primary care and specialised services, so those will uh, come to us. Uh, in addition, we're having discussions with uh, national arm's length bodies about uh, what in addition can be devolved so that um, we can f fulfil our key um, uh, mantra, if you like, which is uh, in the spirit of nothing about us without us, um, no decision about Greater Manchester without Greater Manchester. And that's the, that's the discussion we're having now with a range of, of, of national bodies, including with Monitor and the TDA. Um, shall I answer on what might be... Um, cause us to fail. Um, I don't think that um, the f there will be failure at national level on this. Um, I think that they will hold their nerve and the colleagues that I've been working with at NHS England in particular uh, are determined to, to follow this through. Um, it, failure comes if we don't hold our nerve and if we're not ambitious enough. Um, I think we need to be ambitious and we need to go for this and uh, it'll only be our own reticence that makes us fail. That's, uh I thought the question was what's uh, devolution, what's collaboration and what's uh, 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 prevention and uh, devolution I think as Ian said is at the end of this everything is devolved, uh, there's not a lot left that, that isn't uh, devolved and everything is collaborative and that there is nothing within this that doesn't require co collaboration, it requires collaboration at different uh, spatial levels which will go from uh, the neighbourhood level through to the, uh, through to the Greater Manchester uh, level. But the key element of, of this is, is a different way of designing services, that they are designed around uh, pe pe people uh, rather, rather than being imposed upon uh, people. I, I suppose in terms of uh, my view of what could lead to failure, uh, this, is that uh, for a range of organisations with different backgrounds to work together, requires an enormous amount of talking to each other, uh, working, uh, working together. And actually, what if, if we lose that willingness to keep talking to each other, and when things go wrong, 
uh, when, and they will go wrong, that uh, we forget that actually we need to talk to each other to solve, uh, to solve those things. That, I think that, so actually it is people and the people within the system that are probably the biggest risk of uh, failure. Uh, the good news about that means it's within our own control. Um, what, what can make it fail? I think what will make it fail, I don't think it will fail in Manchester, because I think you've got good people doing innovative things. But I think it, it will fail elsewhere because it won't start elsewhere, because the level of political paralysis is so great, the level of institutional distrust between certain entities is so great, that there will never be any impetus to move. Now, the interesting thing is, what do you do? Do you just throw up your hands and abandon the, the people who live there to their fate? No, I don't believe that. I actually think that, as a, somebody who comes up with policy ideas, um, I would impose MERS. Uh, I, would impose, um, I would impose unified solutions. I, I would have referendums about MERS to deliver unified solutions, because the cost of not delivering unified solutions, the cost of not delivering um, integration is so high that I don't think a national government should tolerate it. And uh, I think that ResPublica in its uh, core cities report, Restoring City States, argued for an introduction of a duty to collaborate. I support that. Uh, I would like that to have real legislative force. But I increasingly think in areas of stasis, and the government's accepted this in other areas, but I don't agree with national state takeover. I don't think that works. I would like to see local takeover. I think where there's paralysis, let's have the political and institutional and professional honesty to admit it and create a new institutional solution that can deliver on it. To answer the, the gentleman's question about de devolution, collaboration, um, and integration. I think you've named it. Let's devolve first so that we then can collaborate and so that we can then integrate. Oddly, once you've established though, that sort of power, then actually good practice follows. You know, and I'm not just arguing this for northern cities. I think the morality in London is very weak. So, so the London mayor can't, for instance, control London boroughs. And, Given the level of deprivation you have and the potential gains, I think that's a scandal. So I think let's look at radical institutional redesign. Let's be brave, but let's make it from the bottom up. Right. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of um, time. I'd, I'd, I'd be very grateful if you could all thank the panel for, for coming today. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions afterwards as well. Um, if I can ask you to vote for... Um, the session that would be really helpful. I don't, I, if I can ask the panel to stay, um, we're going to pass over now to Michael O'Higgins, who's the chair of NHS Confederation, to sum up today. So thank you, Michael. Do you mind if we stay?